Empowering listeners from the US to the UK. Live on air with Stephen Cuoco. You are in the Actors and Athletes Studio with Stephen Cuoco and one of my favorite people in the whole wide world, Mr. Jake Jensen. Jake, I've got to get us a designated intro for our show in the Actors and Athletes Studio because even though this is an extension of Live on Air with Stephen Cuoco, we've got to get both of us highlighted. We cannot leave you out. So I'm going to be working on someone putting together an intro for us for any actors and athletes studio. All right. I'm, that sounds great. I, yeah. And I'm thinking, you know, since we're very popular in the UK, hopefully, you know, I may go ahead and find someone uh, out of the UK to do it. I, I just think it just adds more sophistication to, to hear that intro from someone outside of the U.S., I, I, you can never go wrong with that, especially <laughs> a British, I, I have a thing for British accents or, or UK accents. So, uh, <laughs> no, no complaints for me there. All right. We're going to have a British intro. <laughs> <laughs> Whether you're listening on the iOS or Android app, Alexa and Apple music, uh, we are with you everywhere in anywhere and if you happen to not be able to listen to the live of in the actors and athletes studio with Stephen Cuoco and Jake Jensen, you can listen to it on any one of the podcasts, your favorite podcast platforms of live on air with Stephen Cuoco, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, and Spotify. We covered the Olympics most recently, got a lot of great feedback from the conversation. I believe from some of the comments that were made, some of, some of the listeners were surprised of what we touched upon because no one else in media were really talking about the dynamics and the, the intricacies of breaking down uh, the mental health of athletes and what some of these if not a lot of them whether in the olympics or everyday life jake as you know because this is your field as a sports psychologist and as an accredited college professor that they face which is why today we're going to be looking at under the pressure confronting the fears and anxieties of athletes in the spotlight and you reference jake and i'm going to put it verbatim that you're actually teaching um, something of this as a course in your classes currently at university. Yeah, that's correct. I'm currently teaching a psychology of injury class. And it's, it's a very interesting class because I've got former athletes in the class. I've got students looking to uh, become athletic trainers. Uh, some are looking to go into physical therapy or occupational therapy. Some are wanting to be coaches. And if you're a coach, you're going to deal with athletes that, that get injured. And so it's a very diverse group of, of students in there with a very interesting background. And then I have a, a couple of graduate students in there as well. So it's a um, small class. It's only I have about 16. No, I think I have 18 students in there. But it's it's a good group. And we cover a lot of these, you know, challenging topics. The the what injury, both on the physical and mental side, is such a such a tough thing for athletes to go through. We know that athletes often often worry that injury could not only affect their physical performance, but also limit their social presence and fan engagement. I highly doubt, and there's this there's feeling that I get when I see an athlete post something online of an injury from your experience, because I really don't know about this part, but it feels as though they didn't want to show that they've got ice or their ankles bandaged up or anything, but yet they're sharing it. So to begin there, is that something that they do automatically that they're used to doing is to share something on social that they were injured or are they encouraged to show the realistic side of sports that's not all trophies and glitz and glam and parties and money? This is my opinion, but I think a lot of times they're crying out or maybe that's too dramatic, but reaching out for support. 
because the often the injured athlete feels very separated from from their identity as an athlete. They feel separated from their team. A lot of times the rehab that they're going through is done at the same time that practices. So they're not with their team. They're not with their teammates. They're not with their coaches. And I think social media has honestly become a way to reach out and, and feel like there's a support system around because they are not feeling. And, you know, I'm speaking from a college uh, athlete perspective the most because that's what I work with the most. But a lot of them feel very isolated and just uh, and separated from their normal uh, support system and their normal support structure. And I honestly believe that a lot of them are sharing that because they're looking for, I, I hate to use the word sympathy because that sounds weak, but searching for a community that's going to fill for them, that's going to reach out, that's going to provide a, a support structure and system. So that's what I think, honestly, is is what's happening a lot. Yeah, I was going to ask if you thought if it was the f- the fear in itself is rooted in the potential of loss of visibility or the relevance during recovery periods, because I've been noticing that a lot, especially with uh, football athletes. They are really, really confident to highlight their recovery periods. It feels very different from an injury post to a recovery post. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's, again, coming, that's a little bit different. That's showing that, hey, I'm still, I'm tough and I'm going to be coming back stronger and better than I was before because, and I think a lot of them honestly are, are do believe that, but I think that also the more they can show that, that, that helps them or, you know, hopefully does help them feel, feel more confident coming back and, and successfully getting through the recovery. Do you think, Jake, that they all need some sort of professional guidance to manage the psychological stress that comes with injuries or is it just different from person to person and at what level of exposure and priority they take not only within the sports industry but also with the type of sport that they play and at what level of exposure if we think about Travis Kelsey to uh, maybe in uh, Ayer Asante, you know, with the New York Giants. What are your thoughts on that? Does it change? Well, I think, it, you know, I think there's always going to be different uh, different personalities, different individuals and in how they handle injury. But I absolutely think the more support that they can have, and that can come from, you know, I at my university, I'm considered part of the sports medicine uh, team. So I, you know, even wear a sports medicine team shirt. I am very much part of that team uh, that that helps uh, with the rehab of injuries. So I'm working very closely with athletic trainers. I'm working very closely with the strength and conditioning coaches as they start to build a program for the athletes, you know, in terms of rehabbing and coming back. So it's very much a team approach. And I do think that the mental psychological part of that team is, is a really essential part. Some may reach out to me a lot more than others, and that's fine, you know, for individuals. But I am certainly consulted for every, every, almost every rehab uh, plan that is put in place for an athlete. And I think that's important um, because it also provides the support to the athletic trainers and the strength and conditioning coaches as, as they're also figuring out how to best help the athlete. So I very much see it as a, as a team approach to uh, rehabbing injuries. When we consider and look at the public perception, you know, to uphold, you know, we're all, we're all looking at, I'm not going to say that you and I are in this way. I I'm, can speak for myself. I'm not worried about always upholding a positive image, but is it different with the athletes that you're working with that there is an underlining pressure of public perception? And is that something that is kept more behind the scenes when it comes to counsel or are these athletes extremely transparent with you of what they're currently going through with public perception, or is that something you also get them prepared for as like, okay, when, you know, your, 
background as being a professional tennis play player, do you get them prepared for public perception and the pros and cons of it? Or where does it begin with you? I think it begins with me is, I mean, again, and this is, this changes somewhat because I'm at a university rather than a professional sports team where we certainly have media coverage in LA and the San Fernando Valley, but there's less of that than if I were working with, you know, the LA Lakers or the, or a professional team. So I, but I do think it's important for the athletes to prepare for a certain level of, of public perception of media coverage. But I think the, the most important thing is to start with the individual and, and there's enough, already often fear and anxiety and uh, they may not publicly show that, but there's different stages of grief they go through depending on the severity of the injury. There's a lot of often frustration and and unknown whether they're going to even, you know, keep their scholarship, decide to redshirt. So there's so many, I feel like, decisions even before worrying about what the public is going to be saying that we often are are dealing with just more pressing, urgent concerns and and emotions and feelings. But I will say my guess is, and I'm certainly talking with other sports psychologists that do work with professional teams, that the media is absolutely something that you have to prepare the athlete for because they don't just wake up knowing how to best approach the media, respond to media, and that can, I think, certainly cause a lot of uh, additional stress and anxiety that is not always, certainly not conducive to, to healing and rehabbing faster. So, yes, I think it's important to look at the athlete and their situation and, and then prepare them for whatever they're going to be facing. It brings up a good point. I had a conversation with someone today. And this one athlete who signed with this management company is a very well-established MMA competitor, fighter. And he had faced back in 2020 charges of sexual misconduct. He was exonerated of all charges. I guess these two women were, you know, put a claim against him. And I just watched an interview from a month ago and the anger and resentment and the the betrayal that he went through, you know, those years and feeling, you know, being a man. And now besides the women that he trusts that are in his life and close to him in his life, he was sharing in the interview that he has to record conversations and he's taking photos and if he's going on a date and things like this and the pain he is, you know, the fact to where four years later, that pain is still there. And to look at and consider, uh, you know, being a publicist and, you know, how PRs, uh, you know, agencies or, you know, in-house PR reps are working with these athletes. You know, I said to this one person, I said, they are still, athletes are still not being properly governed, um, uh, educated of how to properly handle not only an interview and it's okay to to feel the way that you feel but i said to this one person i said you are a management company and i said how are you able to get any sort of sponsorships whether it's nike or gucci or prime or red bull or or pepsi or anybody when this interview that's not even or barely 30 days old it's not so much the the problem that what had happened to this athlete four years ago, that it is important he was exonerated, the charges were dropped, but that pain was so powerful, Jake, that he was so angry and volatile. His words, 
the way he threatened of what it was going or what was going to happen to his opponent. And he said at least five times that he's going to take everything that was done wrong to him out on his opponent even though it wasn't the opponent's fault. But this is what was going to happen in the match. And I said, that's a PR disaster. That's a company disaster. Someone should have spoke with him, had sat down like someone like myself, someone like you. And it's not so much getting him prepped to manufacture him for the interview. But there's no way at all do I see a company, let's say if it's Red Bull, that's going to come in and potentially sponsor this athlete if he's in a press conference before a fight and making volatile threats and statements, why would they? Do you see where I'm going with this? Yeah. And I, you know, absolutely. And I think, you know, I I mean, I obviously feel for him what he's gone through, but he's not helping himself at all by making statements like he, that he may very much, well, be using that for motivation in his next fights, but that's that's not the. I mean, again, I'm not in PR, but I could certainly, if I were working with him as a from a sports psych side, you know, you, it's just going to come back and hurt him even more if the media is hearing that type of comments and and you know that's just bringing it's almost bringing up. Oh, well, this guy just has anger issues. This guy can't control himself. This guy is an un you know unhinged uh athlete so yeah i i'm very surprised that for one thing his management would not have counseled or or worked with him on on from a pr standpoint but that's also you know that's really going to keep bringing up a lot of that same feelings of anger and resentment that because but he's he's feeding that image that the media already has somewhat created of him so yeah i think it's very problematic yeah and the one journalist said uh she said you're scaring me it wasn't that you're scary i believe she had said you're scaring me or within that and i'm like that's not you know i get and understand where he's coming from over all in all, still, you know, when we look at the the third component of anxiety over inconsistent engagement, it's not just about engagement or for thinking about social media. It's a fact to where four years later, here is where this very well established athlete is feeling unsafe. He's in fight or flight. He's quick to make reference that if anything uncolorful comes his way how he's going to address it and handle it and i'm thinking like this isn't just my area jake i mean this is your area too where these this person is with a multi-billion dollar company and is a professional fighter and has management and no one cared to sit down with him before the interview to just check in to see where he was at um, at least emotionally i mean literally it was about an hour of a, a breakdown yeah yeah i mean this this guy you know he's been through his own trauma from this so you know, it, it doesn't sound like he's emotionally healed at all. And and, and understandably, it's very, very, he's, he probably feels like he's certainly been used. And, but yeah, I mean, this is where, a t- again, a team, including his management, uh, sports psychologist, needs to, to work with him and help him. Mm-hmm. Uh, you wonder how, how often this is happening, that they're still not athletes are still not getting i think as much progress as we made i still feel like a lot of athletes are not getting the the emotional mental help that they need and that just re- reiterates that the example you just gave yeah i mean considering 
what Mike Tyson had gone through, Tiger Woods, Michael Phelps, Caleb Dressel, uh, you know, Serena Williams had has shared at times of what she's faced and dealt with in her life. And still, it goes back to what I said that it's fine if someone has good intentions because they see the best in someone, especially, you know, someone who's a, an athlete. It, it, there there needs to be more responsibility when it comes to treating them better than a machine or a paycheck. And, you know, we see so much, especially online, looking, you know, at the anxiety over inconsistent engagement. You know, fans, they want more. They want, uh, you know, meaningful content less frequent content as long as it's delivering a a good insight and creating good feelings, good emotions. But athletes don't live in a Walt Disney World fairy tale land where they can always give the general public good news all the time. You know, this isn't, oh, hey, you know, I'm Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift and here we are (laughs) attending the Super Bowl. You know, yeah. having cocktails yeah. and then going off um, on a $10 million jet. That's not reality. No, no. Even the Olympics shows, you know, we, there's the fairy tale of I train my whole life and in that one 10 seconds, I, I'm the best in the world and win the gold medal. And then there's the athlete that's trained their whole life and trips on the hurdle and may never get another chance. And I think that's one thing I, I, I hate to say I like about the Olympics, but you see both the fairy tales, which is fun and exciting, but you also see just the, sometimes the depths of uh, pain and, and sadness and mourning and despair that comes from working so hard for something and it doesn't pan out. It doesn't work out. Uh, But sports is, it, it looks so glamorous for certain athletes in certain situations, but it's a, it's a tough, tough road and journey out there for so many of these athletes. And, you know, it's, um, I have to remind myself even now of that sometimes, because growing up, you know, I always wanted to be a professional tennis player and I thought, how could anybody not want that lifestyle? But, you know, being on the road week after week after week and living in hotel rooms and traveling and it, it, we don't always, think about that that side of it as well it's you're not it's not a glamorous lifestyle at for every for every athlete out there what are your thoughts on athletes fear of being overshadowed by other athletes i mean i think that's a constant fear that athletes have Uh, there's always going to be somebody younger and better coming up and you know certain athletes can can stay at the top for a long time, but that's just the nature of, you know, athletics does not, does not get easier as you get older physically, but also I think mentally, because then you start going, Oh, I don't have that much time left. I don't have that many years left. And I think the anxiety often gets to increase, you know, you're more experienced, but you're also facing the pressure and the reality of, Hey, I don't have like 10, 15 years of my career left, but I think injury just, just magnifies and adds to that. And when I say injury, I'm also, you know, physical injuries, but also mental health, illness. Uh, there's so many things that can just, can even exacerbate that, just that natural, natural uneasiness that I think most athletes feel that you're not going to be the best forever. And I think that's just inherent in the world of sports. And there's a huge difference, and you know this, and this may be something – you want to add into your teaching is when does anybody really ask, especially an athlete, if they understand, if that person understands that there is a very, very um, different way of looking at competition and recognition because competition only happens when you are there and you're actively participating Recognition comes not only during competition, but those long in-betweens of recovery, injury, recovery, injury, growth, recovery, injury, growth, 
and then leading up to competition. And that's that's not something I hear a lot about or often, Jake, in sports is recognition. Not only as individuals or, you know, what does it mean more as an individual because we hear, you know, people on football huddling and it's teamwork, 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 teamwork. But still, not every player and for a fact, not every player when we consider recognition is going to be treated equally. Yeah, it's an interesting, interesting way to put it. Um, yeah, if it's competition if versus do, recognition. Recognition, yeah, I think you know the competition is what we often, at least from my sports psych perspective or, or the world that I'm training and and that I come out of, is we focus a lot on the competition because that's where the results immediately show up, good or bad. But I do think that idea of recognition is there really is no off button to that. That's, that's a, a responsibility, but also a challenge that athletes have at pretty much all times. There is no athletes are, are being recognized all the time. They're being looked at, they're being evaluated, they're being compared to others. So I think that's interesting to, I understand why I, I probably do this as much as any sport that we focus more on the competition, but the recognition is a is a omnipresent uh, reality of being uh, an athlete. Considering so, the fact, good, good to think about. Yeah, sorry. No, and uh, please, I mean, this this is your your point as well, because to look at the next step of fear of not securing sponsorships. Competition does not secure sponsorships. It's the recognition of that athlete, of that individual, of how that partnership and sponsorship is secured. Because every contract, every payment, every deliverable is going to be different for each and every person. And I believe when we consider the emotional mental health and the psychology of sport, even modeling and acting and music, everything is competition. The industry wants some sort of recognition to know the difference. Uh, Justin Bieber to Ariana Grande, Matthew McConaughey yeah. to The Rock. There is constant competition out there. I mean, it goes back to one of our conversations I believe we had when we were looking at Netflix and I said uh, that um, Bird Box uh, with Sandra Bullock, in my opinion, and still to this day, is the number one film on Bird Box. Yet instead, some of the stats online are showing that the film with Gal Gadot and Henry Cavill and The Rock superseded that. But why would it? And the only reason why something would supersede something else is if we think about Sandra Bullock and Netflix and the branding of Netflix and then Bird Box and then the quality of that compared to three, four other dominant A-list actors, that goes to recognition. And that's where it can mess up someone's state of being very, very much, you know, I mean, oh yeah, you know, yeah. and that's where the competition comes in because, they, because these networks and, and, and certain people know how to maneuver and put certain cliches together or certain anecdotes together and make something that they hope to guarantee through recognition underlining some sort of competition even if it's to beat out a former box office hit or uh, if they're in a series or a sequel there's a huge huge difference yeah 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 i was just thinking on, on that recognition i was uh i just the us open tennis just finished uh, a couple days ago but Early in the tournament, um, Emma Raducanu, who's a British player, won the U.S. Open like, three years ago, I believe, as a total unknown. She she was in the qualifying, won it. No no qualifier had ever come through and won the tournament. She's young. She's British. She's attractive. Signed multi multi million dollar 
deals with Nike and and uh, other other non sport companies. I think um, I want to say L'Oreal and and others, but she has not won a tournament since then. She's also had two wrist surgeries, uh, but she she lost in the first round of the U.S. Open and was just in tears, you know, and just just in tears and and because she's now faced, you know, she's the recognition's there, but the competition and the results have not followed the recognition that she got from winning the whole thing three years ago as an, as an unknown. And she's had a very hard time having the, she got the recognition without the competition really to back it up. I mean, she won the US Open, but other than that had not, you know, had the results. And it's been a very painful, long process for her and then physical injuries as well. But it was just very, very interesting and sad to see, you know, her just in this press conference being drilled about her schedule, when she's going to play, how she's going to deal with losing these big sponsors and and how she's going to define herself as an athlete from here. But I... Uh, so I think this this idea of recognition and, and competition is is an important one, and it's and it, it is very interesting. And then where sometimes when that recognition probably comes almost too early and too fast, whether the results from the competition maybe aren't there consistently to back up the recognition. So it's an interesting, very interesting talking point. Which brings us to fear of not meeting performance expectations and concerns over privacy issues. So athletes may face anxiety over not meeting their own or others' expectations, especially when public attention is high. So when we look at Jake setting realistic goals, mindset training, and peer and mentor support, all of those are important, yet when we look at peer and mentor support, how can a team, an organization, uh, even coaches, continue to do those checkpoints for peer and mentor to support in order to help keep the goals realistic, check in to see where the mindset and the emotional state of wellness or unwellness is at with an athlete, whether in training, recovery, or in competition, where would you like to begin on that? How can we simplify by making that easy, especially beginning with peer and mentor support? Oh, there's so many places we could start. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have to cram it yeah, all in one, but I knew I know this is your area and you're going to have a lot to well, share. I, you, you know, you called me earlier today and I was uh, just finished up another meeting. But I had an athlete in my office in tears. I'm not going to say the sport, but um, transferred from another university and is simply not feeling like uh, they're meeting the expectations of of the new coach and 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 they're you know, just very upset and distraught about it because you know transferred here to my university had big expectations for how things would be going so far and they're not going that well and um, is already worrying about getting cut from the team or not, you know, keeping a scholarship and, you know, and it just catastrophizing the whole situation. And, and I just had to say, Hey, slow down, slow down. Let's, let's think about it. you've only been back. I mean, you've only been here now a few weeks. Coaches know that you're going through a transition period, not only trans transitioning and transferring into a new university, but uh, a new city, a new, a new not a new state, but a new city. You don't have your same friends, support group. So the expectations from the coach, they know you're going through this, this, and it's not going to be the easiest time. So let's not already be panicked, you know, and this app is like, yeah, but I'm already worrying if I not get, if they're not going to let me play. If they're not going to let me keep my scholarship. If I'm not even going to be on the team. And I just, I think that happens where athletes just start catastrophizing the situation. And it's like, okay, Coaches, I know, put a lot of pressure on, but they also know that there's going to be some adjustment and transition time. And let's not, you know, let's not start catastrophizing yet. Let's let's talk about what you can control, what you what's out of your control. There's a lot out of your control, but there's still things in your control. How are you showing up for practice? What what are some process goals that you can focus on rather than 
by you know thinking way too much ahead to whether you're even going to be playing how much in the lineup you know and you're still a couple months away from season so i think a lot of it is just athletes go into panic mode when they're not performing and not competing the way they want not even competing training the way they want and i think they just need someone sometimes to say slow down it's okay let's let's talk this through and let's check in regularly and and you know or we'll we'll figure this out together and i think that's you know that's happening at a at a d1 college level and i can imagine that happens at all levels of sport but um even probably more when this when the stakes are even higher so I, it's just it's something i see all the time and so i i can't underestimate the importance of you know I, these are adults the athletes i work with but they still are very young in a lot of ways and they need they need somebody to help them reframe uh how they're viewing a situation and how how they're because they again they catastrophize it and it becomes all the worst case scenarios and it's just okay let's let's slow down here and, and that's that's where i would start with a lot of these athletes and then obviously go from there knowing that scrutiny is going to manifest itself potentially one way or another uh you know yeah so, absolutely so yeah so prepare for it and then often but don't I'm, get yeah no good yeah, but not get say, prepare for it but don't get so caught up in it that that you're absolutely driving yourself crazy every day <laughs> and and that's just going to make it worse and so yeah it's that daily daily work on it that i think is important or at least consistent work on it when I used to run track, I remember hearing, stay positive, stay positive, focus on a positive or, or you know, uh, you know, the, the old 1970s and 80s, you know, mindset, you know, you got to have a thick skin, you know, build up a thick skin, you know, to, you know, to deal <laughs> yeah. with. <laughs> yeah. But, it, but that um, doesn't help to shift the focus to just hear stay positive when, you know. This isn't the Mickey Mouse Club. I'm not Mickey Mouse. You're not Mickey Mouse. Like we no, only can do no. so much, you know, to keep things in homeostasis. So what are your thoughts on how can how can we in a very healthy way shift the focus but stay in reality? Well, I mean, there's different techniques that I work with athletes on. You know, just telling them think positive. It's like, well, okay, that's great, but this is not a very positive situation or environment right now. So saying, telling yourself to think positive often is, is pointless. I don't want to say pointless, but not, not, it's not easy to do. You can't just suddenly start being positive when the, so what are some ways that you can reframe a situation? How, and being very specific. So I actually have the athletes write down like the thoughts that are going through their head. And then we, they have to like write it out, literally write out a, a, something that, how to reframe that. So, you know, reframing it to, you know, instead of coach thinks I'm the worst and that I'm just a effing loser, let's reframe that to coach has me here for a reason. What can, can I learn from him today? Or what can I get out of the, get out of this practice today? What, uh, what's one thing I can, can work on or what's one thing that I can focus and concentrate on. So it's not just focus, but it's okay. I can't, I'm getting overwhelmed trying to focus on so many different environmental cues, new plays that we're learning, but I'm going to focus on really active listening. So I I'm really hearing what my teammates and my coach are saying. That's going to be my purpose today. I'm not going to try to do everything. I'm going to focus on, on listening and, and, and really, learning these new plays and, and just really tuning in. Uh, it can be things like thought parking going, hey, that's a legitimate concern or thought or question I have, but this is not the moment to think about that. I'm gonna park it away, literally park it in the parking lot, or not literally, figuratively <laughs> park it in a parking lot. And I'll come back to it later. Um, I love the stop sign, uh, the kind of metaphor, you put a stop sign up and go, okay, stop, 
take a deep breath, observe the environment, observe how I'm feeling, and then have a, a thought to proceed. So stop, take a deep breath, observe, and then proceed in a healthier way. And you know, these things take practice just like anything, but at least it gives you some tools that it's not just like focus, man up, be tough, thick skin. You actually have some things that you're working on that hopefully will, will help in these situations. Um, and I've seen it help. I, I don't think it's just say hopefully it's, it, they can help, but it, you have to practice them and, and be intentional and, and, and uh, purposeful about, about doing those. I like to do the, I'm not always the best at it, but I try, I, I like to be when I am in that moment. And I remember is the five step count back five, four, three, two, one, breathe. Sometimes I'll do my yoga breathing in that. And then I'll take action or come up with a different plan. So I'm, you know, being responsible and taking responsibility of what I'm deciding to do or what I don't want to do and make sure that, you know, I give myself at least five counts or five seconds before I officially take action. 